Hello everybody and welcome to my kitchen. Today I am going to do what I affectionately call a develop-a-thon. I have 10 rolls of 35mm C41 color film to develop and I'm just going to walk you through the process that is developing C41 film yourself. It's not actually that difficult but it is fairly involved and you need um, several bits of niche equipment to do this and it gets easier the more equipment you have. So I will just say in general if you're looking to try out color film yourself you probably don't want to go down this rabbit hole unless you enjoy it and then you might want to save a bit of money. The main reasons I do this myself are a I'm a cheapskate and b I kind of like the fact that I can do all this myself. Um, I have a very nice film scanner. I just enjoy the film is never leaving my hands once I buy it. Uh, I take the pictures, I develop it, I scan it, I make my own prints. I really enjoy that part of the process. And shooting film in 2023 is objectively irrational. This is a hobby and I enjoy taking part in all facets of it. So the only thing about color photography that's really difficult, it's not even really difficult, uh, the chemistry, this is the Arista C41 kit. Um, I enjoy this kit because it's fairly inexpensive and it seems to work great. Color chemistry is not stable at all once it is mixed. Uh, it, it maybe only lasts like a week. So that's why I do it in developathons because you can't mix this chemistry and let it sit around for a while. You want to do it, you, you want to get all of your film done in one go. This kit is quoted to develop eight rolls of 36 exposure uh, 35 millimeter film or 120 film, which is almost exactly the same area. But I'm going to push it to 10. You can push it even farther. Eight is just basically where they say this is where we know the results are good. Um, but I'm going to push it to 10, which is the most I've ever done in one session. And we'll see how it goes. Right now, these kits are $27 or $28 each. I don't remember if it was $26.99 or $27.99. Um, and so if you get 10 rolls out of it, you cost about 3 bucks a roll to develop it yourself. But again, all the other equipment you need is not included. Uh, I am going a bit overkill with this stirrer. Uh, you don't need one. You can just stir it by hand. But you are supposed to maintain stirring while you're mixing up these chemicals. And uh, they're pretty cheap on Amazon, so I bought one. So again, uh, the first thing we need to do is mix up these chemicals. I have four one-quart bottles. This is a one-quart kit. It also comes in a one-gallon kit. Uh, personally, I only get the one-quart kit because I could um, I could separate the one-gallon kit, but it just seems fiddly, and it's not that much less expensive. So uh, I think this kit right now, like I said, it's 28, and the one-gallon kit is a little under $100. So given the relatively small price difference for per unit cost, I enjoy just having these smaller kits. So these kits come with instructions and the constituent parts for all of the chemicals. So we have, this is Blix A, this is Blix for sure, C and Blix B. And I have developer A, Developer C, developer B, and stabilizer. Stabilizer, you don't even really mix it at all. You just mix it with water. This is PhotoFlow and a chemical stabilizer for C41 film. And actually, this is the thing I like least about this kit. I've been having an issue where the um, stabilizer leaves a bit of a powdery residue on the film. It comes off, you can get it off with the Q-tip, but I'm gonna actually use a little less than the full bottle. I'm hoping to We'll see how that goes. Uh, but anyway, at first we, we are literally just mixing chemicals together. The instructions will tell you, let me just look on this, the instructions will tell you the temperature that you should start at for the water. I don't care. I'm going to just do cold water and bring the chemicals up to temperature later. This is just saying if you mix these with 120 degree water, it's going to pretty much be right at the correct temperature and you can just go. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to mix these first and then bring them up to temperature. Um, so really, it's pretty straightforward. You just take your developer and you're going to add 20 ounces of water and then add solutions A, B, and C to a beaker, put it in a bottle. It's pretty straightforward. So why don't we get started? 
Oh, other thing, I have a garbage bag down on my countertop because I learned the hard way that the developer will stain uh, certain surfaces. So I did this at first in my bathroom, which has a marble countertop, and I have a couple of yellow stains on the countertop, and I know that that was not from the Blix. You will see that the Blix is black once we make it. That was the developer that did that staining, and the developer is clear when it's made. So always put something down if you are going to do this on any sort of precious surface. Um, ideally, I would do this in like a utility sink, but I don't like being in a confined space like that. And plus we want some ventilation from these chemicals anyway, so I'd rather just do this in the kitchen. I'm gonna get some gloves um, and I've got some safety goggles too. I would recommend wearing those just in case. So I'll be right back. Safety squints are engaged and I've got me gloves on. So again, consulting the instructions for developer, we are going to use 20 ounces of water. Uh, tap water is totally fine. Um, I've used various sources of tap water, never had an issue. I suppose if you want to get distilled water, you can, but uh, I don't bother. So, 20 ounces of water. I'm actually gonna go a little bit light on the water, just because the uh, one quart bottles that I have are pretty much exact, and uh, there is barely any room for error here. So I'm gonna go just a tad a little bit light on the water. Here's our water. Don't forget, actually that stir was definitely in Blix, so I'll use a fresh one. Very sciency. Uh, so uh, let's separate this out because we don't want to screw this up. Blix, I'm gonna put you back there. Stabilizer, put you over there. Um, does it actually matter what order you put these in? Not sure, uh, and where's my knife? There's a reason you're only seeing this angle, because the rest of the room ain't pretty right now. Found it, okay. So normally the seals on these bottles are just never, they don't come off easily. So uh, I have a knife stand, you know, in fact, I'm just gonna go straight there. Just poke a hole. This is not a knife I use for anything for food wise. In fact, it has uh, the yellow stuff on there is PLA from some 3D printing misadventures. So we add our developer part A. Try not to do that. There is part A. I'm just gonna stick these bottles in the empty sink. I will rinse them out later. Here is developer B. Oh, uh, speaking of the difficulty of getting to these chemicals, uh, they cannot be shipped internationally and they have to be shipped via ground. So whenever you buy color chemicals, it is a little bit, like it doesn't really matter, but like if you're not in the US, you can't order from Freestyle. I really like supporting Freestyle whenever I can. Uh, they have pretty good prices. I like they're an independent shop and their Arista line of film and chemicals is a very good value. And I love shooting Fomapan, which may or may not be exactly what Arista.edu film is. That's black and white though. So developer B is in our solution. That one went a lot easier. I am a little curious. These bottles all have different seals, different, you know, how they source these kits. Doesn't particularly matter. I'm just curious about it. So that is our developer. It's all mixed up. I'll let it keep mixing for a little bit. But I got a bottle called Dev. We're just gonna put it in there. We'll extricate our magnet.
As I said, there's very little room for error here. That is as full as the bottles go. And now I'm gonna go straight on to rinsing this stuff. Hold, please. You probably saw that bit of developer get on here. I'm gonna just use a paper towel, wipe it up. Now, the developer, to me, I don't smell it at all. It doesn't have an odor that I can detect, um, but I can sort of taste it. Just not like, I'm not drinking the developer, obviously, but um, I get a metallic taste in my mouth very faintly when I am around it. And I get this experience with most photochemicals. So like, they're definitely not harmless, um, but if you're worried about like a strong odor, I don't smell anything from the C41 chemicals. I just have that very, very faint taste in my mouth. I know that sounds super healthy and it's a little bit scary, but uh, again, that's why this is not rational. Nobody needs to do this, yet here we are still doing it. So now let's move on to the Blix. Blix is a combination of bleach and fix. Some people, it's combining two steps into one. Some people will tell you that uh, you shouldn't use a kit with a Blix step. You should have separate bleach and fix steps. Um, I don't think it really matters. I've gotten great results from this kit, but uh, something to something to know about. So with the Blix, we're gonna add 18 ounces of water to the beaker. And again, I'm gonna do a little bit less than 18. Okie dokie. That's a little too fast. Now we have Blix Part A. This is a very thick, almost syrupy liquid. Blix Part B is basically very concentrated vinegar. So this is the only, this is the only one that really smells. Um, it's so concentrated, it kind of dissolves the... This has happened in every kit so far. Kind of dissolves the uh, foil seal or... It's in two parts. I don't know if you can see that on video. But this stuff, boy does it stink! Because it is acetic acid, just much more concentrated than your typical bottle of vinegar. Okay. And then Blix C, this is the fun one. This is a, a it's got a lot of iron in it and it looks like blood. Actually, not. it doesn't look like blood. It's much darker than blood. But this is handy because you won't mix, you won't confuse your developer and your Blix, because as you will see, it's dark. Oh great, and I got some on the, it's not pouring super well. This is why you put something down. So this is not truly black, it is a very, very deep, deep reddish orange, but it might as well be black. Yeah, I'm gonna grab a towel. Got quite a splatter that happened back here. That's just from, that's just a few droplets. This is a very, very dark solution. It will stain. Okay, so. This is now mixed. Um, I am going to try to rock the beaker back and forth a little bit because I see from my not super careful pour there. Come on. That 
And that is our Blix. So what I always do, you'll notice I left a funnel on top of the developer. We're going to need to reuse that funnel as we are using the kit. So I separate funnels. And here is that lovely chemical. And I don't know if you can tell from the pour, but this is a weirdly viscous, dense fluid. It's fun stuff. And this, again, it smells a bit of vinegar, but that's it. The odors are very, very mild on these chemicals, which surprised me. Let me get the stir out of there. There's your Blix, and now to rinsing. The beaker, that is. Now, that's really it as far as mixing of chemicals, because the stabilizer is just water and this. So, and also the stabilizer is not temperature critical. So I'm gonna clean up this mess, and then we're gonna resume at the next part. So we no longer, yeah. So we no longer need any of our fancy stirring stuff because all we have left to do is the stabilizer. And again, that is not temperature critical and there's only one thing. So for this, I'm not going to actually put in water first. Can't fill it up all the way, but I, this is photo flow as well as a stabilizer. So this is gonna be a bit sudsy because it's literally a bit of soap. Um, I can see there's a spot of the blicks over there. Again, be very mindful of where stuff goes. I always keep a paper towel, a little crumple bit to pick up these little blobs of chemical just to prevent staining. So the stabilizer, the cap just came right off. I'm not gonna put it all in, I'm gonna put most of it in but I'm gonna leave maybe a quarter of it in the bottle just because, again, I've had some issues with residue. I'll just fill this up the rest of the way. And this can just have the cap put on and be inverted a few times. So stabilized is super easy. So now, color photography is very temperature critical. Uh, if the temperatures are not exact, the dye couplers will not work correctly, and the color mix will be off. So, all these chemicals for this particular kit need to be kept at 102 degrees Fahrenheit, which is that Celsius. And there has been a wonderful innovation that has made film photography a lot easier. Color film, I should say. And that is the sous vide cooker. Uh, I bought this only for film. I'm not much of an adventurous cook, but sous vide cookers will maintain a water bath at whatever temperature you would like. And most of them will happily do 102 Fahrenheit or the uh, range you need for color photography. And you'll notice that there's another bottle there. That is gonna be filled with water and it needs to be temperature matched as well. So here's what we do. I have a pot. Should be in this cabinet, if I remember right. Yep. This is my photography pot. I'm going to put it, I'm just going to move it to the back a little bit. And our bottles of chemicals, I'm going to sit in the pot like this and I'm gonna loosen the cap, but leave it on there. I never tighten that. I'm gonna fill this up with water. And I'm gonna click Flip the sous vide cooker to the side of the pot. Now I can't 
can plug it in right now, but I don't need to. The next critical step is to fill this pot with water. Oh no, I thought I could reach. I gotta scoot this over a little bit. Now I'm filling it up very close to the top on purpose. I, I would ideally have a little bit of a deeper pot, but this is the old, it's the best I've got. Um, and this uh, sous vide cooker will shut off if the water level gets too low. And when, when I'm in the middle of developing stuff, I need to pick these bottles up. But also you want, the whole purpose of the water bath is to keep them at a consistent temperature. So you want it as little exposed above the water as possible. So I'm gonna plug in Mr. Sous vide and uh, turn it on. Set to 102 Fahrenheit. Uh, so it's gonna take it a while to get up there. Oh, you can barely see that, cool. I'm not paying any attention to framing. And I can scoot this a little bit back carefully. So it's gonna take it a while to get the water bath up to 102, and then it's gonna take a while to get the chemicals up to 102. So this is just a whole lot of waiting. And you may have realized I made a mistake. I took the funnels off, and I don't remember which one was which. So I'll just rinse them out real good. It doesn't really matter at this point. The chemicals, um, you do not want Blix getting in the developer, but it's okay if a little developer gets in the Blix. So, um, because that's going to happen. What's when we actually develop the film, it's going to be a very rapid bam, bam type process. Um, but yes, for now, literally just let this sit here for a couple hours. I have a thermometer, which I can actually test the temperature of the chemicals. And again, ideally, uh, the, I would have a deeper pot. I just don't. So that's a pretty convenient pot to use because everything fits in there pretty well. But, um, if I didn't explain, this is going to be the first rinse of the film. Uh, you want to just wash the film first and get it up to the development temperature. And you just do that with plain water. So this is just a bottle of water to sit in the water bath to be the correct temperature. Um, it can be reused from roll to roll, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then the stabilizer does not actually need to be kept warm. Room temperature stabilizer is fine. So if by now this doesn't look too intimidating to you, uh, you're pretty good. This is actually a normal three bath development process. It's developer, Blix, and then stabilizer and photo flow. So if you're familiar with black and white chemistry, it's gonna be very similar. Uh, the only thing is it's a lot faster, temperature critical, and somewhat time dependent. Uh, initially, I believe you only develop for three and a half minutes. I also need to make sure 102 degrees Fahrenheit is correct. It is. So. Those are your steps for a hand tank. Hopefully that's focusing okay. So yeah, it's just three and a half minutes developer, six and a half minutes of Blix, and then you wash it. So it actually goes very fast. Um, so, but as far as the process, it's just having a water bath and mixing these chemicals ahead of time. And then it's pretty much the same as black and white films. So I used to be pretty intimidated by this. Uh, but once I realized, oh, sous vide cookers, just use that, uh, it's a lot easier than it has ever been to do color by yourself. So again, we have a lot of hurry up and wait going on right now. I'm going to stop recording and I'm going to tidy up the little bottles, get them rinsed out and disposed of. And uh, then we will move on to the next step, which is loading film. But that's really not any different, so I'm not going to focus too much on it, except to show you you wanna prioritize, so stay tuned. All right, with our chemicals warming up, and I do want to point out, uh, cause I kinda just went really quickly over it. The caps are not tight because we are um, warming up these chemicals. Honestly, we're only warming them a little bit beyond room temperature, so I wouldn't be too worried, but in case anybody was worried, those caps are not tight. So next, uh, we gotta talk about prioritizing your film. So those are my development tanks. Younger me had fun with a v set of vinyl lettering. This is my stand development instructions to myself in case I ever forget. Uh, I use plastic tanks because I find the self-loading of these rolls to be extremely convenient. Um, but I'm not gonna get into that. 
This is something that if you are interested in color development, I hope you already know. Definitely start with black and white first because it's way easier, way cheaper, and uh, way less to go wrong. Plus the chemicals are nowhere near as scary. I honestly I don't think these chemicals are that scary, but um, still black and white is pretty straightforward. So here are the, uh, hold on a second. These are the 10 rolls that I'm gonna be developing and I have them in order left to right as far as my priority because the chemicals are going to degrade with every roll of film that you go through. And after every set, you need to add a little bit of extra time to the developer. Um, so it gets less and less scientific as you move on. So I have them grouped three, one, or two, one, two, two, one, two, because my development uh, tanks are two, two, and one. Um, I could do two, two, one, two, two, one, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, this film here, I'm very excited to develop. Um, this is called Santa Color 100. This is a surveillance film that Kodak still produces for whatever governments still use this for whatever reasons they have. And it is a uh, relatively low speed, it's 100 speed color negative film, but it's on a clear film base. So the negatives from this should look very different. Uh, what has been happening with the explosion in film photography Kodak is totally milking the resurgence, which fine, good for them, but it means that actual Kodak film is very expensive to the point that there are Indiegogo campaigns, which is what this was, where people will buy up large bulk um, orders of these weird films that Kodak doesn't actually package in 35 millimeter cassettes and then spend weeks in a dark room in Finland, which was the case for this, re-spooling it onto used cassettes that they just get from um, various develop uh, various photo labs across the country or wherever they can find them. And you can actually, maybe you can faintly see in the video, there's a barcode under there. This was some other film. They just re-spooled it with this film. So I'm very excited to try that. Uh, and then this is Ektar 100, which is a very expensive film. This is not a very expensive film, but it's fresh and I am prioritizing what is on there. And then for the next batch, I have Pro Image 100, which is again, not super expensive. Kodak Gold 200, which is a consumer film, but I've never actually used it. I feel very nostalgic for it because I remember Kodak Gold being a kid, but I don't think I've ever used it. Uh, then I have a very old roll of Fuji 400. This expired probably in 2012. It's probably fine though. And then lastly, I have a roll of Kodak, um, what is this called? Color Plus 200. The design of this cassette feels so retro. I just love that. Uh, and then my infamous China Lucky Super 200, which is terrible film. I bought a bulk, bought some of this on bulk, in bulk on eBay when I was in high school. And I still have a ton of it left. So I have these prioritized as the images that I care most to least, and we are gonna start developing left to right. So for now, I'm just gonna put these away. And all I wanna show you in this section is, hold on one second, please. This, this is a leader retrieval tool. And if you are developing your own film and have plastic reels especially, I would highly recommend you get one of these because this will let me get the film leader back out of the cassette. Now, it's going to be interesting with these because they cut the leader in a very, they just cut it at an angle. I went through the effort of actually cutting the leader correctly um, because mostly I was using this in a point and shoot camera that has auto loading and I didn't have a lot of faith that the way they cut the leader was gonna work. So how well this is even gonna work is an interesting question. But basically, this has two slidey bits. They slide one after the other. Hopefully you can, yeah, that should be coming across. Right? And you basically just shove that in the uh, little felt door there, push in the one slider. It's gonna be difficult to do. And then you start twisting this. And you're gonna hear and feel a click That was it. And when you hear that click, you should just push this into the cassette and pull it out. And there is the leader. So 
These are fantastic because what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull all these leaders back out and I'm actually going to start threading them onto those spools outside of my changing bag. It's way easier to just do it that way than it is to try and do all this in the dark and then you can put the put all that stuff in your changing bag and it goes super super fast. So again, let me just show you this is super straightforward. It does take some practice, but you just shove it in, push in the first one, turn it a bunch of times. Eventually it's going to start binding up and you'll hear a click. Also feel it. Push that in, pull it out. It's that simple. I love these things. Uh, so I would find one of these if you're at all interested in doing your own film photography. What you can also do, you can actually just pop the sides off inside of a changing bag with a, um, you know, those old fashioned can openers, like the kind that you pierce the lid of a can for like condensed milk or whatever. Uh, but I find it way, way easier to just use one of these. Some people may not like this because you have, especially for this, the film will have gone through the felt, out in the camera, back in, and out one more time. And there is always the risk of scratches. But I've never had an issue doing this. Any, any scratches that I find, I don't think were the result of, of this. So I'll just show you. It's, I'll just do all these five so you can see. Stick that guy in. Push that up. Turn. I always do it two clicks. Up, down, there's the leader. So these don't look super great because I've cut them myself. But again, A, I wasn't sure if the uh, camera would load it correctly and using this, I didn't know how that would go. So A, I'm happy they went that well with the Santa color. Here's our Fuji cassette. There's the leader. Again, these are so awesome. And our Ektar cassette. Now, of course, the danger here is that, like, if you don't remember, if you don't immediately develop it, you're going to have a bunch of what look to be unused rolls of film hanging around. But, I mean, you ought to know what you're doing. So then, literally, I will get some scissors... Just cut that flush and then grab my tank or my reel and just thread it like that. So I'll just do this outside of the changing bag. Uh, I just gotta make sure that the uh, pokey thingies can move freely. I'm sure I covered all this in my main channel video. That's why I'm kind of just rushing through it. But I will just pull out, you know, enough to not not so much, because you do have to worry about going too far. But I just get these all started like this, outside of the changing bag. And then all I need is the tank, the reels, this thing, the lid, and a pair of scissors. And then it's just extremely fast. So this is how I do it. Don't let anybody tell you that their way is the only way because there are plenty of ways to do this. But yeah, I will stack these up, have five ready to go, quickly do them in the changing bag, and then uh, again, it's hurry up and wait. So you don't need to see me fumbling around in the changing bag because that's literally just boring as anything could possibly be on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, so I just wanted to show you A, film leader retriever, great, love it. B, if you got plastic reels, load them up like this before you put anything in the changing bag and then just have at it uh, you know do the twisty thing and eventually you're going to run out of film so just snip the edge off twisty twisty put it in the tank super easy uh, i would recommend so long as you're okay with pulling the film back out through the felt lining one more time which i think you, you should be this is definitely my highly recommended method but if you don't like it that's okay all right, folks, and here's where things get messy and move fast. Uh, I upped the temperature in the, of the sous vide cooker to 103 because I took a measurement of the water inside and it was 101. So uh, obviously one degree Fahrenheit probably doesn't make too much of a difference, but I upped the temperature. Uh, because the water is already at 101, we are pretty much ready to go. Uh, so that's what we're gonna do. However, before I start, uh, I just wanted to point out
I couldn't help myself from peeling off the labels on the Santa color to find out what exactly these were. Now, two of them, this used to be Kentmere 400. This is a film stock I've never actually shot. I haven't shot any Kentmere film, but I have some. This was Portra 400, which I have shot once before. But this one was interesting because I peeled the, the label off and it came right off and the cassette says FOMA. So FOMA is, uh, they are in the Czech Republic and they make black and white film. But the label that's underneath the Santa color label, if you hold it up to the light, this is a 400 speed Lomography color film. So that makes me wonder if FOMA actually makes that film for Lomography. I don't know, somebody ought to know, but this is, what was it? This is Lomo Chrome 400, I think. Lomo Chrome Purple 100 400. New formula. I have to look up for the light to see that, but I just found it very interesting that it's in a FOMA branded black cassette. And also, this film is like chartreuse sort of like awful icky yellow color, but it does appear to be, I don't know, anyway. That's just me being curious. But yeah, so I've got the five films, they're all loaded up. This is what I wanna do first, and then I wanna do the single tank by itself, and then the one next to it. And I'm gonna get gloves put back on, and then we will just go. It's pretty straightforward after that point, but I am gonna, I'm doing things a little bit differently this time, which I will explain as I go. Okay, so you can't see it, but in the sink, well, I, I can turn you that way. In the sink, I have a film washer doohickey thingy. Now, that will be able to wash five rolls of film at once, and I have the water running to get some warm water going in there. Now, what has traditionally been a really slow part of this process is the rinsing step slows everything down. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna do these rapidly. I'm gonna do develop blicks, a little bit of rinsing by hand, and then I'm gonna pop them in the film rinser and start the next set. I'm gonna do the stabilizing and the final rinse all at once for all of these rolls, which um, might be a mistake, but you don't know till you try. So that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna speed things up a little bit to hopefully get some quicker results here. Just because, you know, the actual development time on these films is only about 10 minutes, but to do three sets has taken me about uh, like two hours just because of all that in-between processing. So I'm gonna try and speed this up. Let's see how it goes. So yes, I literally just want that to sit there. I'm just going to let the film sit in a water bath for a while. So yeah, we are going to get going. This is pretty straightforward. I need another funnel here. Now, the other thing is I'm doing agitation incorrectly. My tanks here, the O-rings, they leak. And because they leak, I don't like to invert the tank. There is this spinny boy, which sticks in the hole here. And you can actually turn the reels using this. I have had just fine luck just agitating that way, um, but I have had some color inconsistencies noticeable on 120 film. And I think the reason why I had that was because I normally just leave this out when I develop, um, but I may not have just agitated enough. So today I'm gonna do, I'm gonna leave this out because I don't have a big enough water bath really to put that in there. So the temperature is gonna fall a little bit, but rather than uh, do periodic agitation, I'm just going to continuously agitate very slowly, just a little bit, and we'll see how it goes. Um, I would say this is more art than science, but honestly, this is a science. Oh, and I haven't even touched on the fact that C41, the process C41 is consistent no matter what the characteristics of the film are. If it's an 800 speed or a 100 speed or a daylight or tungsten or whatever brand it is, it doesn't matter if it's C41 process, which they will say on there somewhere, process C41. Doesn't matter the specifics of the film, you do the same process. So 
everything. Doesn't matter if I've got two different film stocks in there, so long as they're both C41, it's fine. That's the whole point of it. Uh, but yes, so let's get going. The first thing we're gonna do is just the water rinse. And that is purely to warm up the film. And also there are sometimes some layers that come off the color. The color that comes out when I pour this water out is often a very different color. So this, the timing is not super important. I'm going to fill this up till I see that it is full. You won't be able to see that. It takes most of the bottle. Okay, it's full. Now I'm gonna do some twisties, and importantly, I'm gonna bang the tape, the tank against the countertop to dislodge any bubbles. This is just a pre-rinse. You only need to do this for about a minute. So I don't even have the stopwatch running because I'm just watching the clock. So this step, all we're really doing is just getting the film wet, which will make the uh, developer make sure that it all goes on consistently. And then we are also bringing the film up to temperature as well, or at least close to where it should be. Um, while I'm thinking about it, I'm remove the caps here. I'm not being exact on the time here because, uh, again, it doesn't super matter. But what will typically happen is the water that goes back into here is not going to be clear anymore. It will have some sort of color. Is that in shot? It is. So hopefully we see. This is that Santa color. I've never developed it before. So we'll see what it looks like. What color will this be? It's a bit purple, okay. Very interesting. And you could, in theory, change that water out with every, uh, every time you develop something, but I've never bothered doing that. So now, this is where timing gets important. This is the first roll that I'm developing. So I'm gonna pour this in and start the stopwatch as soon as it's full. That's how I've always done it. I'm gonna move this around because I can go at the back. Kinda of wanna pour as fast as you reasonably can. if you can hear the cicadas outside. It's that time of summer. Okay, it's full. So I'm starting the stopwatch and we're gonna to go to three and a half minutes and then pour it back in. So this is film developer, just like any other film developer, except what's happening in chemistry that I do not understand, even after watching Dustin's fantastic videos, the color film, because the developer is oxidized as it reacts with the silver molecules, there's a dye coupler in each individual layer that is going to be activated by the development process. And that dye coupler is going to change, it's going to add color to the emulsion. In color film, the actual image is made of dyes, not silver. And so what's happening now is both the silver molecules or the silver crystals are forming with this developer and the dye couplers are forming as well. So if I, right now, the image is gonna be pretty much black and white. The color will be there, but the silver crystals will prevent you from seeing that color. Hope that makes sense. So the silver crystals are there and around the crystals, there's little clouds of dye and they're forming as this chemical is uh, acting upon the film. And so in the developer step, you end up with the latent image, it's forming, and you're actually getting two latent images. You're getting that black and white image as well as the color image. The next step, the Blix, is actually to get rid of the black and white image. So the bleach in Blix, it's bleach and fix, is going to dissolve the silver that's forming right now, and the fix is going to get rid of 
the undeveloped silver halides. If you remember from my black and white videos, the film is opaque until you use the fixer and then it turns clear. So Blix is doing two things at the same time. It's removing the silver, so that way the film, the color is there, the dye couplers are there, and it is removing the undeveloped silver halide crystals to turn the film transparent. It's wildly complicated chemistry and it's almost amazing that it just works. But it took years and years and years and years of development haha, <laughs> to uh, turn this into a process. And C41 is the current color negative film process. I don't remember when exactly it's, it started. It's been around for decades. But yeah, so I am probably over agitating the film, but again, I've had issues with color consistency, so I'm doing that on purpose. At three minutes, I'm going to stop agitating and get ready to transfer because this is the, uh, this is the part that needs pretty quick movement. Okay, I'm just gonna let that sit for the last 30 seconds, rinse my stirrer. Sit that right there. And now, at 3.30, we're gonna pour this out, quickly put that back in the water, and then pour in the Blix. Time is not super critical, you're just gonna overdevelop it a little bit. And technically, I could pour out now. I'm just gonna start, here we go. We tend to get a little bit of bubbles coming out of here, so just be aware that's gonna happen. Now we move on to the lovely Blix and just pour. This is also going to stop the development process, so it is a combination stop bath, bleach, and fixer, all in one go. And this is not timing critical at all, you just need to do this for at least six and a half minutes. Because again, what this is doing, right? Now that I've added this in there, it's going to dissolve the developed silver, because we don't want that, otherwise we won't see the dyes. And it's also going to dissolve the undeveloped silver halide crystals. So the film, oh, I just threw all the snippings away. The film is opaque prior to development. This step clears it up and also reveals the dye. Uh, in professional C41 processing, there are often two different steps. I don't know which one goes first. But yeah, so basically just gonna agitate this until, uh, ten, until the timer says 10 minutes. I'll go to 11. And again, this uh, the instructions, you don't add time to the Blix, so honestly, it may already be done. Um, but you, you can't over Blix it, so you just keep it in for a while. Keep spinning the agitating machine. And the Blix is also not as temperature dependent. I think the instructions say it need to be between 95 and 105. So, and honestly, I don't know if it's temperature critical at all. It's just the timing may be extended. Um, here's my Blix funnel. And again, as far as cross-contamination, a little developer in the Blix, not a problem at all, but you really do not want Blix getting into the developer. So, um, if I were super paranoid, I would cap that, but I'm not that worried about it. But as you saw, we went directly from developer to Blix. So Blix is able to tolerate having some developer in it, but if you put the Blix in the developer, it's just going to completely alter. I mean, it may not ruin it, but the colors may not come out correctly. Because that's the wild thing, right, about color photography. You've got three, at least, layers, three different layers of photosensitive material that are only sensitized to different ranges of wavelengths, and they have to create a different dye color in this process. And 
that's part of why it's so temperature critical because the reaction time between the three different components, there's, a, there's only one point at which they all happen in the correct ratios. So if you don't do the temperature correctly, uh, you might get a very yellow cast to your image or a very blue cast, I believe, depending on which direction you go. And it's really hard to color correct to get that cast out of there. And remember, this is just how photography worked until basically the beginning of this century. And even then, film stuck around for quite a while. And it's now coming back because it's fun. And the quality of the images you get are... There is a, there is a quality to them that can't easily be replicated, I believe. And part of, honestly, part of what got me back into color film was that, you know, I've shot RAW with my nice DSLR and played around with RAW files and everything like that, but you tend, at least me, I tend to really um, agonize over what colors are correct, how to make the image very pleasing. You know, you do so much in post, I guess you'd call it post-production, with modern digital photography and there's always been this kind of like tension in my eyes, in my mind, between what was, what is actually there, what's the real representation of the image, and what's creative work. And with film, you know, I, I started playing around with a new program called Negative Lab Pro, which allows you to scan, you actually scan your negatives as a positive, and then it converts it to the correct image in software. And, you know, just the colors you get out of it just by pressing a button. They're so pleasing to me, and I like that that work is off my plate. And again, I recognize this is very, very irrational. Like, photography as an art form does not rely on film, and I don't think I'm a very serious photographer anyway, but I do really enjoy the uh, craft aspects of this. This is a very methodical, deliberate process, and... Uh, I'm only showing you the one part. I'm not even going to get into scanning in this video. I might do it later. I mean, I might. I might. We'll see. But this video is going to be long enough. So I'm about ready to start rinsing the film, so I'm going to get the tap running to water that's close to the, you know, you can just feel this water bath as a reference. I want to get it close there, it does not need to be exactly correct. Pour the blicks back into the container. should be I mean it is done if it's not boy I did a lot of work just get ruined ah uh, shoot see this is why there's there's blicks that's just coming out of here it's hard to do these fill and rinse so I'm gonna rinse it more with the lid off all right And there we are, 
the images are clearly visible. This is a very weird film. <laughs> I'm very excited about this. I can't see any color, but it's not uh, the way that we're looking at it. That's not surprising at all. Uh, but the development worked. So now I'm going to put these spools in my uh, film washer. And I'm just gonna let them sit there. I will be moving directly on to the next uh, set of film, and I'm noticing that is very slightly pink. So again, you gotta, this probably has chemistry on it. You need to be very careful about what you get wet with these chemicals because it may stain. So always put something down that is not going to let water through. You will regret it if you don't. But anyway, I'm going to repeat that process for the other two tanks that you see back there. And um, the only thing that's going to change is I need to add a little bit extra time to the development process uh, before we, uh, because it's being worn out, because at, you know it is oxidizing, that's how that works. So I can hopefully get all these done within the hour, which I should be able to do based on that stopwatch, and then we will start rinsing and do the stabilizer at the end. So again, I'm trying to save some time. <laughs> Save some time here for myself. Let me get a paper towel, clean that up. I'm gonna stop recording now because I think you get the gist, but I'm just, what I just did, two more times, then we'll check back in with you. Okay, so after developing all five spools, I have stuck them all in this contraption, which continues, it was, I just had it working well and now it's not. Uh, this is a film washer and that is supposed to stop flowing. Let me uh, help it along here. Maybe because I moved it. This is a greedy cup siphon. It's a very interesting contraption, but it, I tend to have problems getting it to operate correctly. It is supposed to fill with water and then dump it all out and then fill with water again. So the idea is that you're continuously rinsing the film with fresh water. So it stopped and now it's filling up and right when it hits the top, it should just drain out. And see, it's not, it's not working right. It's so hard to dial this in to get the correct amount of water flow, I have found. I almost wonder if it's worth even bothering with this thing. Plus, the top film reel barely gets any water on it. So honestly, I don't even know how well this thing works. But it's an interesting contraption, and I figured I'd show it to you. But yeah, it is supposed to just automatically stop, then fill up to the top, and then drain out. And it's just got an adapter hooked onto my faucet here. Well, what, hap what tends to happen is it gets, it's not flowing out as fast as it should. And so then it just very slow, like this is mainly flow coming out of the faucet. If I stop it, you'll see it will continue. And then you hear it gurgle. Anywho, uh, so I gotta rinse the film for quite a while. I did notice as the film, because what I did was I had this filled with water and I was just putting the reels in here and letting them soak. Now the water was starting to turn pink around the areas where it had been sitting. So that's why you gotta rinse, because the chemicals are they're still in the film. You wanna get them out of the film before you dry it, because uh, they may long-term affect the film's stability. But this little film washer thingy, ah, doesn't work that great. Either that or I just have terrible luck dialing in the correct flow rate. Because what I can do is I can plug this up, let it get full, let it go, and then it will work once. I actually had it working right with full-on flow, so let me try that again. It feels wasteful for water, but it was working. See, and now the problem is it's not filling. So that's too much flow. 
throttle it down a bit. Plug that up. As you can see, this is probably more frustrating than it is helpful. But if it works correctly, you should just be able to let this go for like 10 minutes and get a pretty complete film rinse. There we go, that's what you want to hear. But we didn't hear the other gurgly bit. Is this video exciting? It's not exciting for me, it's frustrating. Fill up. Now drain. And break the vacuum or whatever you're supposed to do. That noise. That's the noise we want to hear. So now it will fill. But will it dump? Maybe. It's not quite running as, as much out as I think it should. But the water level is still dropping. Hey, we got it. Okay. So after four minutes of fiddling, now it's in a stable state. I think. We actually got it. Look at that. I'm going to flip these top two around because like I said, I don't... I'm never super confident that this works as well as it should. And it may be that the plastic reels are just a little bit thicker than the metal ones and it would work better with metal, but it does completely fill the top. And the theory of this is it's supposed to be filling in a spiral and then draining through the center, I think. So it's supposed to be, you know, fresh water with every fill. I just don't know how much that top reel, because it actually spends most of the time just dry. But, you know, as far as the rinsing mechanism, that might be just fine. I don't know. But I just wanted to swap those two. I'm going to let this sit for five more minutes, and then we'll show you the last part. Okay, so I'm going to let it keep rinsing over there for a bit longer. I have rinsed this tank out very thoroughly, so this is um, as clean as we can get it. And I'm going to fill this up with the stabilizer mix. Actually, before I do that, I'm just going to invert it a couple more times. So again, this is a slightly soapy mixture, and it also has some sort of chemical in there, which is to stabilize the C41 film. So the very last step is to, after rinsing, Basically swirl the film around in this solution for about a minute and hang it up to dry. So you don't do another rinse after this. This is the very last thing. Then you hang it up to dry. And speaking of hanging up to dry, I need to get my hangy uppy place ready to go. Let me back you up because I want you to be able to see the negatives after I pull them out. And let me get my hangy uppy place ready. Glad I did that because my hangy uppy place was not ready. So I'm literally going to take the freshly rinsed spool and I'm gonna dunk, dunk it in here. I usually just do this completely manually uh, and I do this for about a minute, then we remove the film. Now I do wanna show you with these plastic reels, there's a piece to the removing the film process that I seem to forget every time. And this is gonna be the first time that I've remembered to do this. And that is, you need to pop the film out before you try to separate the reel. Because if you don't, you tend to put a crease in it. Uh, I've done this so many times. It's very irritating to myself. But yeah, we just do this one at a time. I mean, or you do this as you go. But as I said, I think it's a lot, lot faster. And definitely, uh, this is going faster than it has in the past. And even especially because I'm filming it. So you can see it do this, see me do this. But I'm gonna consider that stabilized enough. Now the step that I always forget is stick your finger in here and slip that out. Because if you don't do that, when you try to separate the reels, it forms a crease. 
because it's trying to push against this film and it can't. And there we are, C41 negatives. So this is the regular, this is the brown film base that we're all used to. So this is not that special. I'm gonna hang this up. Let me grab one of these Santa color spools. I'll do that next. So this is basically, it is the emulsion, from what I understand, is not that different from regular color film, but the film base is clear rather than brown. And by the way, the reason the film base is normally brown has to do with the photo paper. Because color photo paper, just like black and white photo paper, you expose it with an enlarger and you, uh, you end up developing the paper. And so RA4 color print paper is, um, I don't know why, but the color, the way it gets exposed relies on the very brown film base for the colors to be correct. So this film, you wouldn't, be make, you wouldn't be using to make prints. Who knows what governments that actually used it for surveillance did with it. I, I sure don't know. But so this film is a very weird, weird color film that no consumers would ever have had access to. But now we do, thanks to Indiegogo campaigns and weird photographers who want to do color a little bit more cheaply. I don't know if that was enough time, but too bad. So again, pop that out. You will regret it if you don't. This looks very weird. It is like a pale ghostly color, let's see. That's quite interesting. Now, it doesn't look perfectly transparent. I hope that doesn't mean I didn't blix for long enough. Um, but I have noticed some, uh, particularly 120 films, when they, when they come out of the last bath, they tend to be kind of weird looking. So let me hang this up. Well, the very beginning, the very center of that film, which would have been the beginning of the reel, uh, was very wrong. Um, it looks like it had major light leaks. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that would have been the people who, who put it together. Uh, we'll see when I scan those. Um, the other roll, the, the other color film looked perfectly fine. As is this, this looks as I would expect it to look coming out of there. But yeah, that first roll of Santa color that I took out, a little bit, a little bit wonky. I will say, whether that was my development or... No, I don't think it would be the development. But somehow the beginning of the film got very messed up. The only theory that I have right now is I have a light directly above here, and if maybe that would have gone past the light traps uh, on the tank. I don't know. Normally, I don't have these lights on. I have them on for you because I'm recording this. We'll see if that was a colossal mistake, if it affects the rest of the film rolls. Do you mind that I'm blabbering on? I hope not. I have, I have the, can you see it, the stopwatch? Yeah. I'm just vaguely watching it to see what times we have left. Oh, by the way, I'm hanging the film up in a coat closet. I have some clothes, clothes pins, or, yeah, right? Clothes pins on the uh, top of the wire shelves. Yeah, this is fine all the way to the center. So I don't know what happened with that roll of Santa color. This is my roll of Fuji, I think. 
Yeah, it's fine all the way to the end. So, hmm. I have also noticed as I started doing this myself that uh, Fuji film stock is actually kind of really annoying. The way it dries, it tends to curl much more than Kodak does. Um, and every roll of Fuji that I've developed myself has tended to be more of a pain than the Kodak film. So that's interesting. Uh, when I was a kid, for whatever reason, I always preferred Fuji film. Um, I think just because it was different. You know, like Kodak is a very US pop culture type thing, and I think I enjoyed, I mean, interrogate 10 year old me, try to figure out why I like Fuji film more than Kodak. But I, I never developed it myself. I just took it to the grocery store or later Costco. And uh, their machines, their mini labs just dealt with the film. And since I started doing it myself, I have at least noticed that so far, every time I do a Fuji roll, like it came out fine, but it tends to curl more when it dries than Kodak does. And of course, every other film I'm doing here is a Kodak film. And uh, I will say, because I have five more rolls to do, I need to very thoroughly rinse all these reels again. So I'm gonna put them back in the rinsey thing. And then I need to dry them, as well as all these tanks, before I can start again. So there is a delay. I'm not, you're not gonna watch all that. Don't worry. But this is a very, you know, one at a time, step-by-step -step process. So let me pull this out. Hopefully the center of this one is all right. And again, this is weird. The film does not look completely transparent. I don't know if that's gonna get better as it dries. This one has the same issue. I'll show it to you this time. As I get, well, I can't really show it to you. I'll spin it this way. It's not as bad, but the beginning, the beginning definitely got some light leaks on it. Can you see that? And it's mainly around the edges. So that's really interesting. Let's see if the last one has that too. Most of the roll is okay. But like here, the sprocket holes, that's really weird. I wonder what happened here. That's definitely not, I don't know how my development process would do that. Anyway, uh, cool, or not cool, but at least this one, that looks like an Electrify America station. I don't remember, I don't remember when I loaded this roll of film. Hi, upon closer inspection, I am pretty convinced the problem with the Santa color was the fact that I did the development directly beneath a floodlight in the ceiling. So I had a light source going straight down the fill hole of the development tank and the beginning of the film, like the, the film leader ends up at the center of those spools. I noticed that there was similar uh, light leaky effects around the sprocket holes on some of my other rolls of film but for whatever reason, they just don't bleed into the main body of the film. So I think likely the Santa color film just doesn't have parts of the structure that a consumer film does. So it's very prone to light leaks, wrecking up more of the film, wrecking up, messing up more of the film structure. Uh, that's my guess. I don't think it had anything to do with the people who um, loaded up the film. And I will definitely be more careful next time to you know, try to do the development at least in a more subdued light. And also I will be sure to load that film into a camera under subdued light because I do think, I really think what's happening is uh, light is able to travel within the film substrate more. So there, there's a fiber optic effect going on in that film that the consumer films with its uh, dark brown base that helps attenuate. That's my theory and I'm sticking to it. And here's the last one. I really can't tell at all until I pull it off the reel what has happened here. 
And by the way, normally I like to uh, keep all these halves together, but uh, I was not paying any attention. It does, they're all the same part, it doesn't matter. Um, but you might be able to see that the mess is accelerating. There's a lot of stuff all over the place. This is not for the faint of heart, and I'm only halfway done. But so long as you know you kind of enjoy this quasi-meditative type thing, which I really do enjoy, I don't mind that this is <laughs> many, many, many extra steps on top of just pulling out your phone and snapping a picture. And you know, part of the fun with film is, well, I mean, it's, it's both fun and a bit terrifying, but with this Santa color, if it turns out that all of these rolls have this issue, um, then I will just know that the beginning few exposures might have some groovy effects in them, and don't count on them to come out perfectly. Let's see how this one fares. Yep, same thing, they're all like this. So that's something of a bummer, I will be honest. And it's all like exactly the same. It starts turning very green at the end there. But this is the start, this is the start of the film, not the end. So interesting. But then like just a few frames in, the, the problem seems to only be around the sprocket holes and not at all around the uh, center of the film frame. So very, very odd. So that's it. You have now seen the C41 development process from a kit with my twisted little uh, change up of leaving the film in there. So just let it sit. Uh, yeah, anyway, thanks for watching. I might go into scanning it in this video, but this is going to be long enough, so there might be a part two, or I might just go to show scanning. But now the film has got to hang up to dry for really, it's best to just let it stay for at least 12 hours, so I'll, I won't get to scanning till tomorrow. Um, and now what I got to do is rinse out all my development tanks, uh, rinse out all the film spools, and get ready to do this again. Because uh, I will, like I said, those chemicals, they're not going to be good if I just let them stay there. So we got to just do the next five rolls. But it looks like uh, we had perfect development aside from those weird hiccups with the Santa color. But it is also possible that the direct overhead light broke through the light seals in the tank. Could be. If any of you out there have experience with Santa color and you saw the same thing, let me know. Um, the next roll I shoot, I will be sure to develop it, and I will be sure, A, to load it in more subdued light. I thought I did every time, but maybe I didn't. Uh, and then also, I'll be sure to have these lights off when I'm developing it. But uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this off-the-cuff video. And now I get to do this all over again, and you get to watch something else. So enjoy whatever it is YouTube suggests you to watch now, or whatever you want to watch. You can do your own person. You don't have to listen to the algorithm. You know, there's a feed called the subscriptions feed, which apparently nobody uses anymore. And it just shows you the things you're subscribed to. It's wild. Yeah. Anyway, bye.